All right, so my name is Josh Henry, and I am a PhD research assistant at North Carolina State University. Today, I'm going to be discussing the pour through method for nutrient monitoring. So why pour through? The pour through method is a quick, easy, and accurate way to monitor your plant's nutritional needs. It can help you to determine if your plant's nutritional needs are being met properly. And uh, in the first part of this presentation, we're going to quickly go through how to put together a pour through kit. So the things that you'll need to put together your own pour through kit. Uh, first, most importantly, you need a pH and EC meter. Uh, you can see the one on the screen is a combination pH EC meter, but of course they also come separately as an individual pH and EC meter. So uh, whichever happens to work for you. Either way, you will also need to have pH and EC calibration solutions so that you can calibrate your meter whenever you use it. Uh, a lot of times these Calibration solutions come in larger bottles, and so uh, it's also really useful to have a small jar or a vial in which you can keep your calibration solution to take with you, and uh, that way you can take just a small amount out of the whole solution bottle and not have to use all of it. Additionally, you will need saucers to collect leachate from the bottom of the pots. You'll want some small cups that you can pour the leachate into uh, after it's been collected. You'll want a bottle of distilled water that you can use for the pour through method. And also you will want a box that's optional, but is very useful if you want to carry everything together. So here you can see an example of a pour through kit that uh, we use here. Uh, you can see we have a large plastic box in the middle. Uh, note that this one uh, has a handle on the top, which makes it very easy for transportation. It's very useful to take around with you. There's a bottle of distilled water. That's very important that you have some distilled water. Uh, your calibration solutions, again, small jars or small vials work really well for this. Uh, small plastic cups, saucers, and then of course a pH and EC meter, uh, which is absolutely necessary for doing the pour through method. So next I'm gonna just talk through the steps of how to conduct the pour through method. First, you're going to want to start off by irrigating the crop you want to ensure that the substrate is extremely well saturated. Uh, if you use a constant liquid feed uh, fertilization regimen, you're going to want to irrigate as usual, so use your fertilized irrigation water. However, if you're using periodic feeding, for instance, if you're only uh, fertilizing once a week or uh, once every certain number of waterings, you'll want to irrigate with clear water and then uh, conduct a pour through the day prior to your fertilization. And then you're also going to want to conduct a second pour through the day of fertilization. And this will help you to uh, see how your plant is, is doing and the, the differences between when it hasn't been fertilized for a while and then when it has been freshly fertilized. In step two, you're going to place your plants in saucers uh, after allowing them to drain for 30 to 60 minutes uh, after that initial irrigation. So you're going to place the pot or the cell pack uh, in a saucer. And it's very important to note that you should sample a minimum of five pots or cell packs per crop when you're doing uh, pour through uh, monitoring of your crops. And here's just an image to show you uh, what you can do to uh, use a, a cell packs. You can just simply put a single cell pack in a six or eight inch saucer or whatever size saucer will fit the cell packs that you're using. And you will essentially conduct the pour through in the same way that you would do with a regular pot. Now, as far as plant selection, it's very important that you randomly select plants from throughout your crop. Uh, you wanna go to the interior of the bench uh, you want to pick plants from the middle, from the back. Uh, you don't want to just pick everything from the front. I know it's very easy to just take a group of plants from the front, but that's not going to give you a representative sample, and it's not going to show you how your entire crop is doing. So it's very important to select from all over the bench or uh, just throughout the crop. And additionally, it's important that you select crops with different pH and EC requirements, uh, as if you are... Uh, hitting all of the recommendations for, for one certain crop, uh, you may not be hitting them for a crop that prefers a lower pH or a lower EC. Uh, so it's very important that you just have a, an idea of how all your different crops 
are doing. In step three, after you've put your pot in the saucer and uh, you'd already let it drain uh, for 30 to 60 minutes after that initial irrigation, you're going to want to add some distilled water to the surface of the substrate. So you're going to pour the distilled water and it's going to displace the solution that's in, currently in the substrate and that's going to push it out into the saucer. It's very important during this step that you be very patient and you don't add too much water. You may add what you think is enough water and for some reason it's not coming out. Sometimes it just takes a while for, this, for the uh, leachate to come out. So be patient, don't add too much, or you may have issues with uh, the incorrect EC values uh, for, your, for your crop. So just as a reference to show what volume of distilled water you want to add to the substrate, for a cell pack or a four inch pot, you're going to add about 30 milliliters or one ounce of distilled water uh, to the surface of the pot. For a five to six inch or 12 to 15 centimeter pot, you'll wanna use about 75, to 75 milliliters or two and a half ounces. And for a six and a half inch or 16 centimeter, or larger pot, you're going to use about 100 milliliters of distilled water or 3.4 ounces. And of course, these are just uh, initial values to go by. It's very important to know that the volume uh, that you wanna add to the pot can vary from pot to pot, crop to crop. Uh, different types of substrates have different properties. If you have a very uh, loose substrate uh, with very large particles, uh, you may see the leachate come out much more easily, much more quickly. Uh, crop, there's maybe crop to crop differences depending on how uh, many roots there are in the pot uh, and how quickly the, the plants are taking up the water that's in the substrate. And also there may be differences even within the same pot size and the same crop due to uneven irrigation. So these uh, numbers that I just gave on the last slide are uh, just a reference point to start from, but it's very important uh, that you just collect the same amount of leachate per pot. So that is step four, is where you're going to collect the leachate that was displaced from the distilled water. So you wait until enough water has come out of the pot and into the saucer. If you collect too much, it will dilute your EC, which will indicate that you have really low soluble salts. And if you collect too little leachate, you're going to have really high EC readings, saying that you have really high soluble salts. So it's really important that you collect a consistent amount of leachate per pot, and uh, you just keep your measurements consistent as you go on. And so here are some of the optimal leachate volumes that you'll want to collect. Uh, for a cell pack or a four inch pot, again, you're gonna wanna collect about 30 milliliters or an ounce of leachate. And remember, we wanted to add about 30 milliliters to an ounce of leachate. So about the same amount coming out as what you put in. For a five to six inch pot, you're going to wanna use about 50 milliliters or two ounces. And for a six, in, uh, you're going to wanna collect about 50 milliliters or two ounces. And for a six and a half inch or larger pot, you're going to want to collect about 50 to 60 milliliters or two to three ounces of leachate. After you've collected or during the time that you are collecting your uh, leachate, it's also very, very important that you calibrate your meters. Um, and again, you can have separate pH and EC meters or a combination meter as the one you see on the screen. It's very important that you calibrate it each and every day that you're doing sampling. It's also very important that you never pour used solution back into the original bottle as that can give you, uh, uh, that can distort the values and uh, it's just, it's not good to uh, potentially contaminate your uh, calibration solution. So you can see in that bottom left hand photo, you can see two small vials that we use, one for the pH solution uh, and one for the EC solution, which you use to calibrate the meter. And here, just to show you an example uh, for this common uh, pH and EC combination meter, you can see at the bottom of the meter that there are little knobs. One says pH, one says EC. And uh, you, you take the probe, you put it in the calibration solution, and uh, depending on how far off it is from the intended value, for instance, uh, a lot of pH calibration solutions are 7.0. If it's off, you're going to want to turn the knob clockwise to increase the pH or the EC, and you're going to want to turn it counterclockwise to decrease the pH and EC. 
Now, of course, calibration can vary depending on what meter you have, but this is a, a fairly common example of one that you might have. So step six, you're going to measure the leachate that you've collected with your pH and EC meters, uh, and you're going to record your pH and EC values. It's really important that you make sure to write them. It's very easy to forget. Uh, so it's important that you have a clipboard or a notebook or uh, some type of, of hard thing that you can write on. And this is a situation where it may be very useful to invest in waterproof paper or printed sheets, which can help you. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that I've accidentally spilled leachate all over my paper and had just a really messy time of it. So it's very important that you uh, have something to record it. And in step seven, the last step, you're going to want to evaluate the measurements that you just took. So you can see here I have an example of a spreadsheet that I would use to uh, collect my pH and EC values. Here you could have the house number, the week number, uh, your crop, however many pots you sampled. Remember, you're going to want to try and sample at least five per crop. Um, your pH, your EC, and then it's really important also to collect any notes such as the cultivars, uh, whatever bench number, uh, what side of the greenhouse they're on, any visual symptoms you may be seeing. These are all very important things to collect while you're doing your pour through monitoring that will help you to make preventative or corrective uh, decisions if necessary. Just to walk through these steps that we just went through again, uh, step one is to irrigate the crop. Step two is you wait 30 to 60 minutes and then place your saucers underneath your sample pots or cell packs. In step three, you add your distilled water. And again, the volume of that will depend on the size of the container. Step four, you're going to collect the leachate, put it in a small cup. That'll make it easy for you to actually measure it with your pH or EC meters. In step five, you're going to calibrate your meters. Step six, you're going to actually measure the pH and EC. And in step seven, you're going to evaluate your measurements to tell whether your crop is healthy or whether it needs some kind of uh, adjustments for the pH or the EC. And the bottom line here is that what, one of the most important parts of conducting a pour through is that you collect uh, consistent amounts of leachate for every sample that you take. And again, the leachate volumes you wanna aim for are about 30 milliliters or an ounce for a cell pack or a smaller pot, like a four inch. You're gonna to wanna to, uh, collect about 50 milliliters or two ounces from a five to six inch pot. And you're going to collect about 50 to 60 milliliters or two to three ounces from a 6.5 inch pot or larger. And again, I can't stress this enough, it's very important that you sample five pots or cell packs per crop and that these are randomly selected from throughout the crop so that you can get a better picture of how your crop is doing nutritionally. So now that you know how to conduct a pour through, you may be asking how often should I be doing it? So you should be doing it routinely. Uh, after you pot a crop, you should do it initially uh, sometime very soon after the, pot, uh, the crop was potted. And then you should conduct a pour through about every two weeks to just make sure that the plants are doing well and everything is being met nutritionally. However, if you have a problematic crop, such as geraniums, which are known to have a lot of high and low pH issues, uh, you can do pour throughs as needed. If you see any visual samples or, or visual symptoms, it's important that you take samples of those. Um, and you'll also want to take samples with varying levels of symptoms. So for instance, if you have a crop of geraniums and some of them are very green and healthy and some of them are chlorotic and symptomatic, you're going to want to take pour through samples from both to compare. And hopefully you would see that the healthier looking plants are within the recommended ranges of pH and EC. And then the, the uh, plants that have the worst symptoms are going to, uh, have values furthest from the recommended range. And this will help you to figure out what exactly the problem is uh, that is occurring in your crop. And so the key, the, the whole reason for doing the pour through method is for problem avoidance. Because monitoring with the pour through method can help you to prevent pH and EC problems before symptoms occur. So it'll help you to keep a nice healthy crop throughout the entire growing season. So you should start a pour-through monitoring program today. 
And with that, I would again like to thank our sponsor, the American Floral Endowment, for making this presentation and all the resources we've been providing available to you. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions.